The folks in Blue Falls need your help with a few problems. Remember, no pencils and paper allowed. And I don't want you to even try to get the exact answer. Instead, you'll be learning and practicing some different estimation strategies. An estimation, my friends, is about getting close enough. Hi, my name is Fitz. I live in Blue Falls with my uncle, and right down the road lives my good friend Martina. Blue Falls isn't a flashy town, but we do have a great school, a good baseball team, and a cable TV station. Until recently, there was only one cable show called the Mini Mood Express. It was very popular because, well, it was the only show. But then a new law was passed. It said there had to be more than one cable show. I guess it was only fair. But Mr. Minimood was very angry. Hello? Mr. Minimood, wanna buy an electronic laugh machine? Only $25. <laughs> Forget it. I've got bigger problems. There's a new law that says I gotta put another show on cable TV. People might stop watching my Minimood Express. Unless... Wait a minute. What if this new show were very, very bad? That would be okay. But how can I be sure that a new show will be really bad? Hang on, there's some noisy kids outside my window. Martina, my teacher says my detective stories are really stupid. How can that be? Writing detective stories is easy. You just compare stuff to completely different stuff. Like this. The city was hot. As hot as a toaster oven that someone accidentally left on all day. I just heard the most horrible writing. I'm getting an idea. Excuse me, uh, could we chat? I accidentally uh, overheard your wonderful detective story. You must be a professional writer. This guy's making fun of you. Martina, please. He liked my work. And you, young lady, are you a famous actress? Fizz, quick! Give me a line from one of your Roy and Frida stories. The city was cold. Colder than a foil-wrapped frozen dinner. Ooh, I am whelmed. No, I am overwhelmed. I've got chills. Ooh. Martina, maybe he is just making fun of us. I don't think so, Fizz. No one can pretend to get the chills. Hmm, I'm getting a, a crazy idea. But maybe just crazy enough to work. I could give you your own weekly show. You'll do your stories with all that stupid, uh, I mean, wonderful stuff about uh, toaster ovens, and you'll be the actors, too. We'll sign a business deal this afternoon. Hmm, I'll split up any money the show makes into four equal pieces. Each piece is one-fourth. If four dollars came in, our whole would be worth four dollars. You kids would get one-fourth. I would take the other three-fourths. You would end up with one dollar. Bye! You still on the line, kid? I'm a genius. I have just guaranteed that my new cable show will be terrible. Well, could they use a laugh machine? Kid, they're not doing a comedy. But wait, a laugh track would make it just that much worse. Mini Mood, we are both geniuses. Martina, Mini Mood liked my detective stories. And he thought I was a great actress. I hope this thing is for real. It is. It is. We should start planning immediately. We'll need a set designer. I'll be director. Fizz, don't forget I'm helping Billy Whippet with his spelling today. Oh, right. Well, I'll go get started. You come by later. Wow, our own show. I got to work on the script right away. Writing was easy. I figured that each show had exactly three equal parts. A beginning, a middle, and an ending. And each part would take two days to write. Fizz! Look, I've got the opening scene done. Let's try it out. I'm a tough guy, and so are you. I start. It was late afternoon. The light spilled into my office like jello on a barn door. Hello, fly boy. What's the good word? Stop! Such acting! Such writing! You'll make video history! This all assumes, of course, that you can put out one show every week. Every single week! Otherwise, we don't have a deal. Well, sir, I just calculated that it will take me two days to do one-third of a show, so... By the way, I bought a laugh machine for your show. 
Gotta run! Ciao! Two questions, Martina. A. Why on earth would we need a laugh machine for a detective show? And B. Can we do one show every week? I hope so, Fizz. If not, I guess the whole deal is off. I got to work on the script right away. Writing was easy. I figured that each show had exactly three equal parts. A beginning, a middle, and an ending. And each part would take two days to write. Fizz! Look, I've got the opening scene done. Let's try it out. I'm a tough guy, and so are you. I start. It was late afternoon. The light spilled into my office like jello on a barn door. Hello, fly boy. What's the good word? Stop! Such acting! Such writing! You'll make video history! This all assumes, of course, that you can put out one show every week. Every single week! Otherwise, we don't have a deal. Well, sir, I just calculated that it will take me two days to do one-third of a show, so... By the way, I bought a laugh machine for your show. Gotta run! Ciao! Two questions, Martina. A. Why on earth would we need a laugh machine for a detective show? And B. Can we do one show every week? I hope so, Fizz. If not, I guess the whole deal is off. It turned out that we could write a show every week, and even take Sundays off. So we worked for six days straight, and our first show was ready to go on the air. It's the Roy and Frida show. He's a tough guy. She teaches math as a second language, and they're both detectives. Late afternoon, the light spilled into my office like jello on a barn door. <laughs> I was packing protection. I called her Daisy. Daisy is my scary hand puppet. <laughs> Suddenly, I saw a silhouette through my door. Her glasses fit like a fence around one of those amusement parks where you wouldn't want to take your grandparents. Hey, Flyboy. Impress me with your detective work. You have a Pez dispenser in your pocket. You took the Park Street bus. Your hair dryer doesn't work well on the low setting. Close. I was at an amusement park with my grandparents. That's when the truth hit me like an open-faced sandwich. <laughs> she was working on the Skivvy case. So I said, let's go visit the crazy professor at University Grill. The sidewalk spread out like plaster on fresh pasta, and I was in love. The morning after our show, Martina came by with a newspaper. On page 10 was a review by Blue Falls TV critic Ambrose Tweetwig. He was also our history professor. It says, Roy and Frida is the strangest, stupidest program I have ever seen. There are two things I really hated. First, Roy tried to scare the audience with a hand puppet. I, Ambrose M. Tweetwig, would never be frightened by a puppet. Secondly, Roy used the phrase, crazy professor. I resent this insult to professors everywhere. This is Ambrose Tweetwig with just one man's opinion. Wow, he hated the show. We'll be the laughing stock of Blue Falls. Oh no, Fizz. Here come four older kids in a car. I hope they didn't see the show. Hey, your show was fantastic. We loved it. They must be teasing us. Fizz, Martina, that was the best show I've ever seen. By the way, a man in a suit dropped off this green envelope for you. Mr. Minimood says the money is rolling in. I've just received $8 from a mystery fan of your show. So, according to our deal, I give you $1. Great! He said he would give us one-fourth of the money that comes in. Now he's done it. Wait, Fizz. He gave us a dollar. Is Mr. Minimood giving us our fair share of the money? Fizz, Martina, that was the best show I've ever seen. By the way, a man in a suit dropped off this green envelope for you. Mr. Minimood says, the money is rolling in. I've just received $8 from a mystery fan of your show. So, according to our deal, I give you $1. Great. He said he would give us one-fourth of the money that comes in. Now he's done it. Wait, Fizz. He gave us a dollar. Is Mr. Minimood giving us our fair share of the money? Mr. Minimood is cheating us. He should have given us $2. Fizz, who should we talk to? Let's ask Billy Whippet. He's an honest man. I know, when you give him his spelling lesson this afternoon, ask his advice. Oh my gosh, Billy Whippet! There's something weird I forgot to tell you. 
Yesterday, when I went to help Billy practice for the Blue Falls Spelling Bee, he wouldn't let me come in. Something was wrong, Fizz. That is weird. I thought being in a spelling bee was the most important thing in Billy's life, other than winning baseball games. We'll have to figure out what's going on. I still can't believe Mr. Minimood is cheating us. We've got to get Billy to help us. And hopefully we can find out what is wrong with him. With only a few days till the spelling bee, Billy has a lot of practicing to do. Billy, are you home? It's us. We need to get your advice. Billy Whippet? Wait, Fizz, a note. Billy says he doesn't want to see us. Fizz, I told you something weird is going on. Hey, Billy, you spelled almost every word right in this note. I know you can do the spelling bee. We'd better leave him alone. Gosh, I never should have talked him into the spelling bee. He's obviously miserable. Oh, Fizz, I've never done anything so foolish. Of course you have. I, I mean, you've only been trying to help him. Remember, it was Billy's idea to try. And if he does well, it'll make him feel great. Hey, TV stars. I saw your Roy and Freddy show. Weird. Listen, if you help me a little, I'll help you a lot. Here's how. Every time you mention the name of my garage on your show, I'll give you something you really need. Trump, how do you know anything we really need? Oh, but I do. I know that a friend of yours would love to be a hit at the Spelling Bee. When the Spelling Bee Commissioner left his car here for a tune-up, I stole, I mean, he lost his official list of 120 words for the contest. So, for every mention of my garage in your show, I'll give you one-fourth of the words from the list. If you're interested, meet me at Long Pier right after your next show. Wow. This could be a great thing for Billy. If he wins, people will stop thinking there's something wrong with his mind. Yeah, maybe he'll go back to school. We'll have to start mentioning Trump's garage in the script. But first, let's go over to the studio to find out what's going on with our one-quarter deal. Martina, when I'm done with Mr. Minimood, he'll be begging. Why, hello, Fizz and Martina. Please come in. Meet my assistant, the Perrymeister. What can we do for you? Ah, uh, Perry, I believe that you did not pay Fizz and Martina a full one-quarter share last week. My heavens, perhaps you're right. How much did I forget to give you? Well, um, one dollar. Uh, but if you don't have it now, you could owe us. Fizz, don't back down now. As a matter of fact, I think we should ask for more than a fourth. We're worth it. Mr. Minimood, in the future, we would like more than a quarter of the money. Yeah, that's right, sir. We insist on one-fifth. We want the money divided into five pieces. That's our final position. My, my. I guess we will have to go along with your demands. Anything to keep your wonderful show on the air. So it's settled. You will get one-fifth. Just in time. Guess what? Another mystery fan sent in a check. Twenty dollars this time. I was about to give you your share of our deal, which would have been five dollars. But now the deal has changed. We'll uh, divide it up later. Gee, that was easy. Almost too easy. Yeah, um, Fizz, I'm wondering whether we asked for the right deal. I mean, now that we're getting one-fifth, Will we get more of that $20 mystery check than before? I don't know, Martina. That's a very good question. Guess what? Another mystery fan sent in a check. $20 this time. I was about to give you your share of our deal, which would have been $5. But now <laughs> the deal has changed. We'll uh, divide it up later. Gee, that was easy. Almost too easy. Yeah, um, Fizz. I'm wondering whether we asked for the right deal. I mean, now that we're getting one-fifth, will we get more of that $20 mystery check than before? I don't know, Martina. That's a very good question. I'm madder than a dozen wet roosters. 
We've got to march right back into that office and demand a better deal. Fizz, think about it. This is actually our own fault. We got greedy and it backfired on us. This will have to be a lesson for us. Yeah, I see what you mean. Let's forget about it and just go back to work. All that week, we worked harder than a, well, you know. I wrote several mentions of Trump's garage into the script, and then it was time. It's the Roy and Frida show. He's a tough guy. She teaches math as a second language, and they're both detectives. What's your name? I ask in a voice all sunshine and pruning equipment. <laughs> she said, You're so smart. Why don't you tell me? She had me painted into a corner. So I said, Your name is Frida? It was a stab in the dark, like Trump in some old garage. Nice guessing, Toastmaster. The barkeep set down a six-ounce shot of Diet Fresno from Trump's garage. I said, Frida, who sent you? Mr. Skivvy sent me to ask for your help. I saw the bartender at the phone. <laughs> Hang up, I shouted. He had hands as big as those pre-molded styrofoam liners used in packing fine stereo equipment. He kept talking. In a motion as smooth and clean as the restrooms at Trump's garage, I pulled Daisy clear of her holster. Scary hand puppet. Now hang up and tell the crazy professor we're here. I don't want to blow our own horn, but that was a pretty darn good show. I agree, Fizz. We are very good at what we do. And we slipped Trump's garage into the script three times. That's worth a lot of words. Yeah, Trump did say he'd give us one quarter of the words on the list each time we mentioned his garage. You know, Fizz, I'm thinking if Billy could see more than half the words on the list, he would be almost sure to win, don't you think? I think you're right, Martina. But do you really think Trump will give us more than half the words on the list? That's more than 60 words. Maybe we haven't mentioned his garage enough times. I know that a friend of yours would love to be a hit at the Spelling Bee. When the Spelling Bee Commissioner left his car here for a tune-up, I stole, I mean, he lost his official list of 120 words for the contest. So, for every mention of my garage in your show, I'll give you one-fourth of the words from the list. If you're interested, meet me at Long Pier right after your next show. I don't want to blow our own horn, but that was a pretty darn good show. I agree, Fizz. We are very good at what we do. And we slipped Trump's garage into the script three times. That's worth a lot of words. Yeah, Trump did say he'd give us one quarter of the words on the list each time we mentioned his garage. You know, Fizz, I'm thinking if Billy could see more than half the words on the list, he would be almost sure to win, don't you think? I think you're right, Martina. But do you really think Trump will give us more than half the words on the list? That's more than 60 words. Maybe we haven't mentioned his garage enough times. Boy, this is close. But still, knowing the words on the list, he'll be able to beat any kid in town. No one will even have a chance. Even if some little kid studied so hard, she'd never beat Billy. Martina, are you thinking what I'm thinking? If you're thinking that it was wrong to do that deal with Trump, that's what I think, too. It just seemed like such a nice thing for Billy. I can't believe we did it. It wasn't fair to anyone else. It's as bad as cheating. Worse. Well, we'll just have to tell Trump the deal is off. Here he comes. Boy, am I glad we realized in time what a stupid thing it was to do a deal with Trump. Oh, it's the TV stars. That was a pretty weird show tonight, but at least you mentioned my garage three times. So, as we arrange... Trump, we've changed our minds. We don't want to see any of your official spelling words. You should tear up that list into a thousand pieces anyway. Oh, that's very noble of you. Too bad, though. I already dropped off the words at Billy's house right after your show, and I left a note saying he had you kids to thank. Come on, Fizz. We've got to talk to Billy. Billy? He didn't answer. But his friend, our friend, Virginia, appeared at his door and gave us a long, cold, angry look.
Martina and I couldn't believe we were too late to stop Trump. And we were also upset about our new deal with Mr. Minimood. Now we were only getting one-fifth of the money that came in. Still, the show had to go on. It's the Roy and Frida Show. The barkeep grinned a grin that could only mean one or two things. Possibly three things, but pretty darn unlikely. <laughs> the 13 stairs leading down to the professor's office had a musty, fetid, gamey, rancid, tainted, and sullied feel about them. It was a vile, noxious, sordid... Roy, you are different from other men. <laughs> I knew it was just the Diet Fresno talking, so I lumbered ahead into the fetid, gamey, musty basement. <laughs> then I saw something sinister. As I dueled with a relentless tubular foe, Rita turned on the overhead light. Roy, you can't live your life in a vacuum. As usual, she was right on target. I grabbed the optional carpet attachment and went deep into thought. On a hunch, I reversed the motor, producing a vile torrent of noxious dust. It was a hunch that paid off. As the dust dispersed, out popped a miniature bronze statue of a half-grown rhino. Sir, I've got some strange news to report. One moment, my good Perrymeister. Mini Mood here. Uh-huh. Yes, I, uh... Oh, dear. Uh-huh, hmm. Oh, yes, uh, yeah, I see. It's that TV reviewer, Tweetwig. He hates the show. Simply hates it. Let me get more details. Hmm, hmm. I am so disturbed uh, by your reaction. Uh, tell us exactly what you hate, and we'll be sure to repeat, uh, I mean, replace it. Oh, uh, uh-huh. Oh, yes, you hate the stupid comparisons. Yes, uh, the silly expressions. The... Oh, well, we'll get right to work, sir. Keep in touch. Sir, sorry to interrupt this happy moment, but I'm hearing rumors that people love the Roy and Frieda show. They think it's very funny. Hilarious, even. Impossible! Who? Why? It, it's so stupid! Maybe it's that electronic laugh machine. Get rid of the machine! I'll remove it right away. And worse, sir, people are watching Roy and Frieda more than your Mini Mood Express show. Big trouble. Relax, Perry. As usual, I have an idea. If that silly viewing public loves a stupid show, then let's give him something adult and serious. Don't you see? Our new friend Tweetwig will write the show. Everyone will hate it. Perry, put together a deal on paper for Tweetwig. Sir, since he's a grown man, we ought to pay him three times more than we pay those Fizz and Martina kids. Fine, I don't care. But after we divide the money up into five pieces and give Tweetwig his share, we'd better end up with more money than him. If that old windbag ended up with more than us, I'd need to cheat a little. Martina and I couldn't believe we were too late to stop Trump. And we were also upset about our new deal with Mr. Minimood. Now we were only getting one-fifth of the money that came in. Still, the show had to go on. Perry, put together a deal on paper for Tweetwig. Sir, since he's a grown man, we ought to pay him three times more than we pay those Fizz and Martina kids. Fine, I don't care. But after we divide the money up into five pieces and give Tweetwig his share, we'd better end up with more money than him. If that old windbag ended up with more than us, I'd need to cheat a little. Martina felt terrible about the entire spelling bee fiasco, but she still hoped Billy would win. And Billy was furious. Even if he could speak, he wouldn't have spoken to us. Martina, there's no way he can enter the bee. We have the list of words. It's against the rules. Probably illegal. And wrong. And Billy was just starting to get interested in doing the B. Please, Billy, don't give up. The word list is not going to be a problem. I figured out how to make everything okay. Trust me. Martina, you know Billy. Even though he never looked at the words, he would never do anything where it even looked like he cheated. Yeah, but the list won't be a problem. Seriously. <laughs> well, we'll see. See you later, Billy. So, what's your big plan, Martina? Well, I haven't got the slightest idea. Jeez, look at Trump down there thinking life is so easy. It's like the mean guys get a better deal somehow. Wait, that gives me an idea. In a minute, ask me right in front of Trump about some rumor you've heard. Well, if it isn't Roy and Franny, how's spelling practice? It's going okay. 
even though Billy would not use this word list, which belongs right here in the trash. Say, Martina, did you hear anything about the rumor? Hmm, I did hear that some commissioner is offering a reward for the missing spelling list. Reward? It's probably just a rumor, but I heard they were offering five thousand dollars for anyone who can promise to destroy the missing copy of the word list. So anyway, Trump. Trump? Where did he go? Listen, you can hear him. Hello, Commissioner of Spelling Bees. I'd like to report that I have the missing list of words, and I can definitely destroy it. And I'd like a reward, too. What? Who is this? Are you telling me that you have a copy of that secret word list? Oh, sorry. I think I might have dialed, you know, the wrong number. Why did you do that? Fizz, what do you think the commish will do now that he knows someone has a copy of the word list? They'll make a brand new list with new words. Cool. So Billy can be in the spelling bee without thinking he's cheating. Hello, Mr. Tweetwig. This is Perry, senior assistant to Mr. Minimood. Having considered your thoughts, we've hit upon a bold new idea. Oh, I'm afraid there is nothing on this planet that can be done for that horrendous Roy and Frieda show. Absolutely nothing. Perhaps not, but we were thinking that you could be the new writer and director of the show. Surely your enormous talent could save it. Um, ooh, ooh, well, you have chosen the right man to save your show. But of course, I shall insist on complete artistic control. Oh, Mr. Tweetwig, it would be an honor to give you all the control you want. We want your seriousness, your cleverness. We want pure Tweetwig. You can stop writing. As of a few hours ago, there is a new writer and director. You will, of course, continue to act the parts of Roy and Frieda. That can't be helped. Now, leave this office. Why are you doing this? I've almost finished the fourth episode. Who'd you hire, anyway? Tweetwig! Good afternoon. I am Tweetwig. I am here to rescue the disaster that they used to call the Roy and Frieda Show. Big changes, a new name, and a 40-page script that I just dashed off. I have divided the script into five equal hunks. That's five-fifths. Memorize one-fifth of it tonight. Wow, that's a lot, but we'll try. Then tomorrow night, you can memorize the next fifth. But sir, that's impossible. Plus, tomorrow is a big practice for the spelling bee. Impossible, sir. The most we can memorize today and tomorrow is 15 pages. If that's not enough, you'll just have to find another Roy and Frida. Fizz, I hope you know what you are doing. I mean, have you figured how many pages there are in two hunks? I mean, in two fifths? If it's more than 15 pages, we're off the show. Good afternoon. I am Tweetwig. I am here to rescue the disaster that they used to call the Roy and Frieda Show. Big changes, a new name, and a 40-page script that I just dashed off. I have divided the script into five equal hunks. That's five-fifths. Memorize one-fifth of it tonight. Wow, that's a lot, but we'll try. Then tomorrow night, you can memorize the next fifth. But sir, that's impossible. Plus, tomorrow is a big practice for the spelling bee. Impossible, sir. The most we can memorize today and tomorrow is 15 pages. If that's not enough, you'll just have to find another Roy and Frida. Fizz, I hope you know what you are doing. I mean, have you figured how many pages there are in two hunks? I mean, in two fifths? If it's more than 15 pages, we're off the show. Well, Mr. Tweetwig, I guess I'll just have to quit. Now, hold on, young man. This was only a test to see how passionately you could act under pressure. Bravo! I, I, I sensed your great energy and anger. But Mr. Tweetwig didn't know how angry we would be in the coming week. As we memorized our lines, he considered seven possible new names for the show. The Tweetwig Detective Hour, Tweetwig Showcase, Mystery Tweetwig Time, Tweetwig Roy and Frida, Tweetwig Frida and Roy, The Muse of Tweetwig, 
Tweetwig the Dark Side? And you'll never believe the new script. Mr. Tweetwig thinks it's great writing, but trust me, you won't believe it. Show, the finest in esoteric cable theater. Deeper into the basement, born on the fragrance of fear, they trekked, ever attendant to any slenderest of telltale residents. What did he say? Hark, Roy, what herald of distant merriment. Twits must be a party of common folk. Tis but a trough of mine entrails that twits yon and forth. This is very hard to follow. Yeah, I'm beginning to lose interest. Once among the teeming throng, our hero and heroine, parched of throat, weary of limb, came unto the punch bowl. But before words were to spill, Frita spied a dazzling substance. Could not be, but tis. Lest mine eyes deceive, there in the saccharine tide lies a miniature bronze statuette of a half-grown rhino. May the briny heavens open to rain down bitter truncheons of reprisal. All right, I say we switch over to Mini Mood Express. Wow, what a bummer. Sir, this is a beautiful sight. Everyone is switching over to the Mini Mood Express show. People really hate Tweetwig. We are finally on the right track. Now let's get rid of those two kids as actors, too. Tweetwig will act. And he has a wife, doesn't he? Let me call Fizz and Martina to tell them the bad news. And let's make an announcement right now, on the air. Martina, let's not watch the end of the show. It's too depressing. Anyway, we should get to the auditorium at least 15 minutes early. Uncle Q, we'll be back after the spelling bee. Sure you don't want to come? Billy Whippet, your star pitcher, will be one of the 20 contestants. So what? Maybe he can pitch, but he can't talk. So how's he going to win a spelling bee? Mr. Quesmet, it's wonderful that Billy is even trying. It's not important that he win. We just hope he gets the confidence to go back to high school. Why bother with school? I think Billy should just stick with baseball. Anyway, if he's still in the running with the final third of the contestants, I'd be amazed, more than amazed. Look at it this way. If you divide the total number of contestants into three equal bunches, the first bunch to get thrown out have spellophobia, you know, a deep-seated fear of spelling tests. The next bunch are average, but the final third are definitely geniuses. If he makes it to the final third of genius contestants, ha, I'll pay for him to take a trip to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Really? You calling me a liar? I'm a man of honor, and that's no shabby offer. A trip like that will cost $300. I thought you said your uncle was getting nicer. Well, wasn't that trip deal pretty nice? Fizz, be realistic. Anyway, we've got more immediate problems, like getting Billy over to that spelling bee. He'll come. Don't worry. Yeah? You're telling me the kids have been kicked off their own show? Impossible! Everyone loves it. Well, tough luck. The kids are history. Washed up. Sorry, but this is business. It's a money thing. Oh, well, what about the mystery person who sent in those three checks because of the show? That's real money. Well, that was... Wait a minute. How did you know there were three checks? We only told the kids about two of the checks. Who is this I'm speaking to? Poor kids. You gotta admire their crazy, stupid dreams. Their own TV show? Billy and a spelling bee? I mean, <laughs> unless, of course, he gets lucky and gets really easy words like cat or house. Then I could lose a disaster of a bet. If he wins, I ought to take the money from that $800 secret bank account Fizz's mom set up for him. She said I could use some of that money as long as I spend it on Fizz. And, well, Billy is Fizz's friend, so that's okay. But she also said I should save three quarters of the money in that bank account for Fizz's college education. 
Wow, I hope that leaves enough money to pay for Billy's trip. Otherwise, I might have to use some of my own money. If he makes it to the final third of Genius Contestants, ha, I'll pay for him to take a trip to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Really? You calling me a liar? I'm a man of honor, and that's no shabby offer. A trip like that will cost $300. <laughs> Billy in a spelling bee? I mean, <laughs> unless, of course, he gets lucky and gets really easy words like cat or house. Then I could lose a disaster of a bet. If he wins, I ought to take the money from that $800 secret bank account Fizz's mom set up for him. She said I could use some of that money as long as I spend it on Fizz. And well, Billy is Fizz's friend, so that's okay. But she also said I should save three quarters of the money in that bank account for Fizz's college education. Wow, I hope that leaves enough money to pay for Billy's trip. Otherwise, I might have to use some of my own money. Oh no, if that crazy Billy wins, I'll have to pay for part of that trip myself. I gotta get out of this. Why did I say that stupid thing about being a man of honor? I better get over to school and see what's going on. When we arrived at the Blue Falls Auditorium, we could tell Billy was nervous. This will be fun, Billy. And there's only 20 contestants. I think you have a good chance to win. And remember, the list of words used tonight will be brand new. There's nothing shady about this deal. Fizz, look who got appointed Grand Bee Master. It's Mr. Tweetwig. Everyone thinks he's the town genius. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, silence please. Before we start, I must announce that all five of the Miller Quintuplets have the Neptune flu, and therefore we will have fewer contestants. But no more chit-chat, let us proceed. Emily Blinker, spell delicatessen. Delicatessen. D-E-L-I-C-A-T-E-S-S. E in. Correct. You may remain on the stage. Farmer Haskell, spell potato. Potato? P O T A T O E. I'm sorry, Farmer Haskell. Off the stage. Billy Whippet, same word, please. Correct. You may remain. After two hours, there were only four contestants left on the stage. Emily Blinker, spell architect. Architect. A R C I A R C H I T E C T. Correct! Now, Billy Whippet, spell misspell. Mr. Billy Whippet, off the stage! I think Billy was relieved it was all over, for him at least. He was rooting for Emily Blinker the whole way. Hey, Fizz, Billy was among the last four contestants. Let's figure out if Uncle Q has to pay up. His bet was that Billy would not be in the final genius bunch. This could be amazing, a trip to the Baseball Hall of Fame. But how many contestants are there in a Quizmet genius bunch? Why bother with school? I think Billy should just stick with baseball. Anyway, if he's still in the running with the final third of the contestants, I'd be amazed, more than amazed. Look at it this way. If you divide the total number of contestants into three equal bunches, the first bunch to get thrown out have spellophobia, you know, a deep-seated fear of spelling tests. The next bunch are average, but the final third are definitely geniuses. This will be fun, Billy. And there's only 20 contestants. I think you have a good chance to win. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, silence, please. Before we start, I must announce that all five of the Miller Quintuplets have the Neptune flu, and therefore we will have fewer contestants. <coughs> Hey, Fizz. Billy was among the last four contestants. Let's figure out if Uncle Q has to pay up. 
His bet was that Billy would not be in the final genius bunch. This could be amazing. A trip to the Baseball Hall of Fame. But how many contestants are there in a Quesmet genius bunch? Billy, I've got great news. Uncle Q said if you were among the last five contestants, he'd pay for you to visit the Baseball Hall of Fame. He says, sounds great, but he can keep his money. Till vacation anyway. I'll be too busy. Now that I've decided to go back to high school, that's where I should be. Billy, that's great. We're so happy for you. So we have our winner, Miss Emily Blinka. It's them. It's Roy and Frida. What happened, Roy? Where's the old show, Frida? We want Roy. We want Frida. We want Roy. We want Frida. The producer of the Roy and Frida show felt that my writing needed help from the gifted Mr. Tweetwig, and so we... No, Fizz. Tell them everything. Our show was stolen from us, and so now it's not as good as it could have been. Fizz, I happen to think you were a great writer and a great actor, too, and I think... We love you, too, Frida. And, and, well, thank you. And the Roy and Frida show that was on cable earlier tonight was not the real Roy and Frida show. <clears throat> Roy, I hear strange noises, and it's so dark in this basement. How dark do you think it is, Roy? Roy, how dark is it? Roy? It's dark, all right. Uh, as dark as the inside of one of those huge wooden home entertainment systems for the whole family. Maybe yes, maybe no. But I got a funny feeling deep inside that there's something funny going on down here. A very funny feeling. Hmm, is it as funny as one of those real estate infomercials? Where a guy on a beach is surrounded by a bevy of young people? Roy, there's something at the bottom of the punch bowl, and it's not pretty. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But you, Frida, are beautiful. Hello there. I'm Miss DuBarney, Fizz and Martina's math teacher, and I've been doing some problem solving with my class. You all did such a great job helping Fizz and Martina solve the problems that came up in their adventures. I thought maybe you could join us. We're going to answer some new questions together. But don't run to get out your pencils and pens, because you're not going to do any writing. You're going to do a different kind of math. The kind of math you do in your head every day. And I won't expect you to get the exact answer. I'll just ask you to get close. I'll show you what I mean. Let's say I'm having a dessert party and I want to bake a yummy double chocolate explosion cake for my friends. The recipe says I'll need two-fifths of a pound of chocolate for the cake and one-quarter of a pound of chocolate for the icing. I check my cupboard and find a one-pound bar of chocolate. I wonder if that will be enough. I don't have to figure out the exact amount of chocolate I need for my recipe. I just need to know if the total will be less than one pound. If not, I'll have to go to the store. Let's take a look at those numbers one more time. Now, let's see what my class thinks. If you think one pound of chocolate will be enough, put your thumbs up. If you think one pound will not be enough, put your thumbs down. Now, if your thumb is up, I want you to stand up now. Good estimating, my friends. One pound of chocolate will be enough. And now, I want you to share your strategies. Scrimp, can you tell me how you decided that one pound of chocolate will be enough? Well, I know that two-fifths is less than one-half, because two is less than half of five, and one-fourth is also less than one-half. So together, two-fifths of a pound and one-fourth of a pound are going to be less than one pound. Excellent work, Scrimp. Here's an award card for you. Now, did anyone else use a different strategy? I did. You need two-fifths of a pound of chocolate for the cake, so that leaves three-fifths of a pound. You also need one-fourth of a pound for the icing, and since one-fourth is less than three-fifths, you can make the cake and the icing and still have some chocolate left over. Another excellent strategy. You win an award card. And keep up the good estimating. Now, it's your turn. Remember, estimating isn't about getting the exact answer. 
It's about getting close enough. Now when you're ready, why don't you try a few? Hi, my name is Fizz, and I want to tell you about an amazing guy named Mr. Barney. He's my math teacher and an awesome storyteller, too. My friend Martina and I are in all of his latest stories. Here's how it happened. When I first showed up in the town of Blue Falls four years ago, I moved in to live with my uncle. But right away, he didn't seem to like me too much. And at school, of course, I didn't know anyone at first. I was kind of nervous, especially about math class. In my old school, I never liked math that much, and I was pretty sure that I was not good at it. The thing I was good at was getting through life one chapter at a time, kind of like I was a character in my own story. Well, as I've said, my math teacher, Mr. Barney, was a story nut. He couldn't teach anything without telling us some kind of story, and that was just fine with me. Plus, he got all of us to help each other with math problems that came up in his stories. Why don't you meet him yourself, and you'll see what I mean. Hello, my goofy friends. I was just about to begin my math class. Won't you join us? I'll be telling my class a story, and there will be a math problem in the story that you'll all have to solve. Our story is about the starship Fearless, pride of the universal empire. During the story, you'll have to listen carefully and write down important numbers and information on the video notes worksheet. Later, you'll use that information to solve a problem. Now, because this is your first time, I'm going to give you a little help with the note taking. But next time, you'll have to decide which information is important to write down. Let's take a look at the information you'll need to record. The Starship Fearless started out with a fuel level of how many heat crystals? If the Starship's fuel level falls below 12 heat crystals, what will happen? The Starship Fearless lost what when it was hit by a comet? So, are you ready to take notes? Good, then I'll begin my story. The crew of the Starship Fearless is in a bit of trouble. The starship captain asked the first mate for a damage report. The first mate yelled that the fuel level was at 20 heat crystals and that if it went below 12 heat crystals, the ship would freeze up solid as an ice cube. The captain said that they had to hold on. Not for themselves, of course, but for the Universal Empire. Suddenly, a violent jolt rocked the starship Fearless. The first mate screamed that they had collided with the comet and that the ship had lost one half of its heat crystals. Is the crew of the Fearless in trouble? It's your job to find out. Here's what I want you to do. First, talk to your teammates and make sure you all agree on the information recorded on your video notes worksheet. Then, use that information to answer team question number one. It says, how many heat crystals are left on the starship after it is hit by a comet? Make sure your answer includes both a number and units. Mr. Barney, what does units mean? That's an excellent question, Scrimp. Let me give you some examples. If I say a puppy weighs 10 pounds, the units are pounds. If you tell me you rode your bike for two hours, the units are hours. The units tell you what the number means. So if I say I ate seven bananas for lunch, the units are bananas. I get it. Units could be a lot of different things. Pounds, hours, bananas, orangutans, just about anything. Yes. Well, it sounds like you're ready to answer the first team question. Remember. Work together and make sure everyone on your team understands how to get the answer. The starship captain asked the first mate for a damage report. The first mate yelled that the fuel level was at 20 heat crystals and that if it went below 12 heat crystals, the ship would freeze up solid as an ice cube. The captain said that they had to hold on. Not for themselves, of course, but for the Universal Empire. Suddenly, a violent jolt rocked the starship Fearless. The first mate screamed that they had collided with the comet and that the ship had lost one half of its heat crystals. Okay, my friends, 
Time's up. Everyone, turn your worksheets face down because it's time for the team quiz. Don't worry, I won't call on any of you. This time, I'll ask a student from my own class. And the lucky team is... The green team. Jason, tell me your answer. Our team says there are 10 heat crystals left. Whoa, nice work. I like how you said both the number part of the answer, 10, and the units part, heat crystals. You and everyone else on your team get an award card. Why would anyone want an award card? Simply because they're incredibly valuable. Now let's take a look at team question number two. It says, draw a picture of this math problem. First, we need to draw a hole and divide it into equal parts. Ashela, in the Starship problem, what do you think should be our hole? I think the hole should be 20 heat crystals. That's the number the ship started with. Great. And how would you draw this hole? I would draw a circle to represent the hole, like this. Good. Now, how can we show how many heat crystals the ship lost? Well, when the starship was hit by a comet, it lost half of its heat crystals. So I think we should divide the circle into two equal parts. One part, that's half of the hole, would represent the 10 heat crystals that were lost. Great. And what about the next part of the question? It says, shade in the part or parts that represents the answer to question one. How much of your circle are you going to shade in? Well, question one asks how many heat crystals are left on the ship after it was hit. Since one half of the crystals were destroyed, that means the other half, or 10 crystals, are still left. So I would shade in half of the circle, like this. Very good. Now, before we move on to the next part of this question, does anyone have a different way to draw the same problem? I do. I drew 20 dots to show the 20 heat crystals the starship started with. Then I divided them into two equal groups, two halves. Half of the crystals, that's one group of 10 dots, were destroyed by the comet, so I shaded the other group of 10 dots to show how many crystals were left. Excellent, Martina. A very different drawing, but also correct. Now, let's move on to the final part of this question. It says, complete the sentences below. Do not use numbers in these sentences. I don't understand. I mean, I know that the whole circle shows 20 heat crystals, and that shaded part shows 10 crystals, but how can I explain that without using numbers? That's a good question, Scrimp. Let me give you an example. Just say my friend Virginia gives me eight apples, but half of them are rotten. How many are left for me to eat? Here's a picture of the problem. The whole circle represents the total number of apples Virginia gave me. This part shows the number that are rotten. And this part shows the number that are left for me to eat. Now, I want you all to give it a try. Work with your teammates to answer team question number two. I don't understand. I mean, I know that the whole circle shows 20 heat crystals, and that shaded part shows 10 crystals, but how can I explain that without using numbers? That's a good question, Scrimp. Let me give you an example. Just say my friend Virginia gives me eight apples, but half of them are rotten. How many are left for me to eat? Here's a picture of the problem. The whole circle represents the total number of apples Virginia gave me. This part shows the number that are rotten. And this part shows the number that are left for me to eat. Now, I want you all to give it a try. Work with your teammates to answer team question number two. Great job, my goofy friends. Now let's see how my students are doing. Scrimp, tell me, how did your team complete the sentences in question number two? We said that the whole represents the 20 heat crystals they started with, and the shaded part is the 10 that are left. Close, Scrimp, but remember, the question asked you not to use numbers. Sorry, but I can't give you any award cards for that answer. I guess you didn't get too much help from your teammates, did you? But don't be too hard on them, Scrimp. They'll learn. Let's try another team. How about... The Red Team! Fizz, why don't you explain your team's answer? Okay, here's what we did. The hole is the number of crystals the ship started with, and the shaded part is the number that were left after they were hit by a comet. Fizz, the way you wrote your answer and the way you said your answer are just fine. 
Award cards all around. All right, guys. Now, folks, we have one last question. Question number three. Why don't you take a few moments now to answer this final question with your teammates? The starship captain asked the first mate for a damage report. The first mate yelled that the fuel level was at 20 heat crystals and that if it went below 12 heat crystals, the ship would freeze up solid as an ice cube. The captain said that they had to hold on. Not for themselves, of course, but for the Universal Empire. Suddenly, a violent jolt rocked the starship Fearless. The first mate screamed that they had collided with the comet and that the ship had lost one half of its heat crystals. Well, my friends, you've done a great job. Just remember, because this was your first time, I guided you through these questions one at a time. But from now on, you'll complete all three team questions on your own. Anyway, before you go, let's see how my students answered question number three. Natasha? Why is the answer to the first question important for the crew of Starship Fearless? It's important that they only have 10 heat crystals left, because if they drop below 12 heat crystals, the ship will freeze. Excellent work! You know, it looks like you're all really beginning to talk the language of math. You know, I really didn't think I'd ever be able to talk math. But then math turned out to be like a second language to me. On the way out of class, I even told Mr. Barney a little math joke. I told him that he was my number eight, minus seven, favorite teacher. <laughs> Pretty funny, Fizz. In fact, Martina and I started hanging out in his room after school to talk about life and stuff. At first, Mr. Barney could hardly believe that the stories we told were really true. But after a while, he got so amazed by our adventures that, well, now Martina and I show up in all of his stories. I can't wait for all of you to hear them.